So the next artwork is going to be um, Marina Abramovich's Seven Easy Pieces, and Bob is going to say a few words about it. Uh, Marina Abramovich, Seven Easy Pieces, 2005. In reenacting 1960s and 70s performances by other artists, Bruce Nauman Body Pressure, Vito Acconci Seedbed, Volley Export Action Pants, Janadol Panic, Gina Pane The Conditioning, and Joseph Boris How to Explain Pictures to a Dead Hair, along with her own Lips of Thomas, and adding a new performance to the program Entering the Other Side, Marina Abramovich spectacularly introduced the notion of reperformance to the art world, a master stroke of self-promotion that brought her and performance art to wider public attention. It also brought her to this museum, which hosted Abramovich's 2010 retrospective, and solidified the artist's position. She now represents, unequivocally, performance art with a capital P. This MoMA retrospective included a number of early performance works, most of which were originally created in collaboration with Ulai, her artistic and intimate partner of the mid to late 1970s. These reenactions were not done in collaboration with Ulai or by the artist herself. These were the result of Abramovich's casting of performers as a director might cast actors to play parts in a movie, and then instructing them as to the actions or inaction to be performed. These performers were surrogates then for Abramovich and Dulai, just as Abramovich, as she staged herself for seven easy pieces, was a surrogate for Nauman, Akanchi, Export, Pane, Boyas, and herself. The inclusion of seven easy pieces in this book is provocative in a way that, as I believe Connie Butler intends, allows us to consider an artwork, or a series of works in this case, that physically embodies an idea which opens up an important discussion on the nature of a genre, on performance art, as Butler rightly states, <clears throat> what does it mean to inhabit the persona of another artist 40 years later and under completely different political, social, and even temporal conditions? When should work be reperformed, and at what point does the original work lose its meaning? She notes that Seven Easy Pieces raises the issue of how historical performance work will be archived and exhibited in the future. And yet the notion of reperformance is highly problematic, and it's quite possible that this is one of the reasons why Seven Easy Pieces was chosen for inclusion in this book. We are in the era of revival, of the remake, and have been for quite a while now. We are, you might say, in a perpetual post-time. Art, movies, music, theater, fashion, all are rehearsed and revived. Why should performance be left behind? Revivals are intimately tied to box office, to making money, and there is no easier way to finding an audience than when they are, in a sense, already assembled. The Broadway revival often sells more tickets than a new play. The Greatest Hits album is very frequently a bigger seller than a newer recording. And the cover song, which began in jazz with the notion of standards, is today a thriving industry in, s in rock where any mediocre band can be the Rolling Stones for three minutes. I Can't Get No Satisfaction suddenly takes on a deeper, more bitter poignancy. Revival's partners, of course, are branding and franchise. With her retrospective here at MoMA, MoMA, the solid rock of institutional, corporate enfranchisement and disenfranchisement, here with her marathon performance, the artist is present, and with the theatrical reenactments of her earlier live works, Abramovich branded herself and not only. For now, more than any other artist, as I said, she stands for performance. She owns it, but not so fast. The only artist or estate who refused permission for Abramovich to reperform a work for seven easy pieces was Chris Burden. Abramovich had wanted to adapt his iconic performance, oh, we have it, Transfixed, in which the artist had himself crucified on the back of a Volkswagen in Venice, California in 1974. He describes it thusly. Inside a small garage on Speedway Avenue, I stood on the rear bumper of a Volkswagen. I lay on my back over the rear section of the car stretching my arms onto the roof. Nails were driven through the po my palms into the roof of the car. The garage door was opened, and the car was pushed halfway out into Speedway. Screaming for me, the engine was run at full speed for two minutes. After two minutes, the engine was turned off, and the car pushed back into the garage. The door was closed. Now, had Burden given permission to Abramovich, this two-minute performance would have gone on for, what, seven hours in the atrium of the Guggenheim Museum? <laughs> Duration is central to performance, but in a culture where bigger is supposedly better, longer is somehow considered to be more serious, 
more high-minded. This is just one of the illusions of art today. I think we can understand why Chris Burden didn't give his permission, because a reenactment by Abramovich wouldn't have been an homage or about the preservation of an ephemeral, quote-unquote, lost work. It would have amounted to a spectacularizing of the work in the person of Abramovich and on center stage in an institutional context in the city of New York, a long, long way, and not only geographically, from Speedway Avenue, a very long way indeed from the spirit of the original work. A persona is the role one assumes in order to display conscious intentions to others. But in a performance, is the performer always assuming a role? Or is it possible that this is the person we are seeing? When Chris Burden refused Abramovich per permission to re-perform one of his works, perhaps, perhaps he was insisting on the fact that he was not, at the time, assuming a role, that this was not a part that he was playing, that he wasn't working from a script, and not on a stage within the confines of art. To any artist making such a request, Burden might likely have insisted, you can't occupy my body and my mind. The artist in, is present becomes what? The artist is displaced. Butler writes, one of Abramovich's primary intentions, as she has stated in interviews, was to set some ethical guidelines for other interlocutors who might decide to re-perform her own work in the future. So, <clears throat> she wants to change the rules of the game in her favor and be the referee. And Butler concludes, in 2010, performance art entered the pantheon of blockbuster exhibitions while posing serious questions about performance art's relationship to exhibition making and the historical record. The historical moment that Abramovich consolidated around her work with Seven Easy Pieces put these questions firmly in the public sphere, end quote. To my mind, the overtaking of bodies is nothing less than vampiric. Artists of a certain age are in inevitably concerned with protecting the legacy of their work. Marina Abramovich is no exception. But her work, it seems, encompasses the work of others and the apparently noble intentions of her Center for the Preservation of Performance Art. In a 1979 interview, Terry Fox, one of the central figures of live art around the Bay Area in the 1970s, said of performance, quote, it really is an attempt at synthesizing communication. It's an attempt at a new communication. But the only people this art exists for are the people who are there. And it's the only time the art exists. I repeat, it's the only time the art exists. With re-performance, it's as if Marina Abramovich, of all people, has completely forgotten why performance stands apart in a temporal reality of its own, apart from the plastic arts in the world of objects, from the paintings that hang day after day on museum walls. Has she also forgotten that it is an entirely unique experience in all of art that bodies in time and space, the images that we now see in documentary photos and video, cannot at a later date be reanimated? and that she risked reducing what was once the new communication of performance to nothing more than the institutionally sanctioned spectacle of ventriloquism, a self-serving travesty for which we cannot, one and all, be expected to pay our respects, pay the price of admission, and applaud. We have a last image. Perhaps, if Marina Bromvich had really wanted to make a statement, she might have reperformed the final work of Bastian Adair in search of the miraculous. Thank you. Thank you, Bob.